if you go a little bit higher, you realize that uh, you have to pay attention to all the diversity of different organisms around you. From a food-loving, strong flavor of ferment lover, there is no better expression of the complexity of life than in the process of cheese. Interesting to realize that on all parts of the process, starting from the life in the soil, you have microorganisms, fungus, bacteria, yeast. Without this uh, microorganism, no life can exist. Fungi are absolutely pervasive in our environment. They are in the air, they're in the soil, they're in water, they're on our skin. They are absolutely everywhere. Fungal spores, we're breathing in you know, hundreds of thousands of fungal spores uh, every minute, every day. They're just part of nature. They go and pick up mushroom in the mountains. Oh! Yeah, yeah, I'm at for three quarts of my name is Vincent Rose and I am uh, 51 years old and I live in St. Luce, it's a small village in the Alp Mountains. So I am farmer for uh, 21 years and uh, we have dairy cows and we make several activity to transform uh, the product. Uh, which size are you? You know your European size? Big size. Big right. size, 45? <laughs> Probably bigger. The farm is called the Farm de saint Luc. We have 150 hectares where we grow grass and crops. We produce cheese. As the farmer, our role is to feed the population. But the basic tool of our job is the microorganism. Why nurture the biome? Why harness the multiplicity, the plurality? No life, no flavor. Concerning taste, the largest scale of flavor you bring to your brain, the uh, richer uh, your brain can develop the understanding of life. Uh, a lot of the sort of traditional, what we think of as American cheeses, are pretty boring. They don't use a lot of fungi. A lot of them are basically just lactic acid. Uh, the cheddar, the mozzarella, some of those things are fairly microbially uninteresting that doesn't have a whole lot of character. Um, they just want it to melt and be gooey. I am Dr. Gordon Walker. I have a PhD in biochemistry from UC Davis, a background in wine and fermentation science, food science, everything sort of involved with the microbes in food. And now I professionally teach people about mushrooms on the internet. Are you fascinated by fungi? We just found a beefsteak. This is an incredible mushroom, Fistulina hepatica. It's a brown rot polypore that's growing here on these chinkapin oaks. Alone, human being is nothing. But fungi are involved way before we even get to the cheese. There's fungi in the soil. You have zygomycetes fungi that are really important, arbuscular mycorrhizae, they're growing with the grasses. Within the grasses, you have endophytic fungi, you have epiphytic fungi on the surface of the grasses. And so the cows go out and they eat the grass, they eat the flowers, they're in the meadows. But guess what? Cows can't really digest cellulose, so how do they do it? There's fungi in their guts. There's little chytrid-like organisms that are in some of the cow stomachs that excrete xylanases and other enzymes to help break down all that cellulose into sugars, which the cows are then able to use to actually make milk. And that's where the farmer, understanding their land, understanding the balance, understanding how to cultivate a good fungal microbiome, not just in their cheese making, but also out in nature, is what's so important to making good cheese. You have to accept complexity of life. Life is not simple in all its biological process. Let me introduce you now Clement. Clement who is uh, making cheese to this morning. When you make bread with your own uh, yeast, dough. sourdough, dough. 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 Well, we, we do the same thing for the cheese. And in this milk, I put a little bit of our own homemade sourdough, special to make this kind of cheese. 
It's a concentrate of yeast and lactic acid producing bacteria. Up. And what I want to do is to test the acidity. If the acidity is too low, it means the bacteria did not eat enough sugar and they did not produce enough acid, uh, lactic acid. They, it means the population of bacteria is still too low. So if I test the acidity, I'm going to have an idea of how many bacteria already ate sugar and uh, produced lactic acid. If the pink color does not disappear anymore, it means I found the right acidity. Okay. It is not disappearing anymore. This is slightly pink. So my acidity is 3.5 donic degrees. So I need to keep it in the, in the, 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 the chamber hot hot uh, chamber for another couple of hours. Actually, there is no uh, cheese recipe. There are types of cheese. We create our own cheese based on the quality of the natural microorganism environment of the place where we are. In that way, we have our own recipe. It's more depending on the kind of microorganism that we have gives the taste of the cheese. Has the milk gone bad or gone good? So here is the uh, cheese cave where we control two criteria, temperature and uh, hydrometry. But you also have to give it time and that's why cheese aging uh, happens in very specific places with uh, controlled conditions of humidity, temperature, the types of even the wood that they put the cheese on. And cheesemakers are very diligent. They go in every single day, they check them, they turn them, you know, they, they play music for them. They are, they're lovers. They absolutely adore their cheese and they adore the microbes that make it. The most important process is the development and the activity of the microorganism. On the farm, we use only raw crude milk. When the milk goes out from the cow, it's sterile, but it gains lots of microorganisms from the whole environment. In the cheese plant, when you receive the milk, it's, uh, you put it in a big basin. Uh, there's a protein in cheese called casein, uh, which is water soluble. First of all, you will use rennets, which is an enzyme naturally present in the uh, gut of the calf. She eats, the food goes in the pants, and then she brings back, and then she's ruminating, like eating again and again and again. And this is where you get the rennet that you make the cheese with. The rennet cleaves the casein molecule in half, releasing these two little sticky ends, or basically kind of a globule of all those casein proteins uh, make a circle around the water and fat in solution. And then all of that turns into a solid matrix because it starts lumping together. So that process of separating the curds from the whey is fundamental to cheese making because you are taking out a majority of the water and leaving this really like nutrient dense fat protein water emulsion which is then processed further to make different kinds of cheese.
But what happens in America is we pasteurize all of our milk. So to get any, any microbial activity, we have to add the microbes back to it. The fats and the proteins, and also a bit of the, the lactose, the sugar. That being said, I think the cheeses made in Europe with unpasteurized milk are generally very, very safe. So in 30 minutes, this will be very compact. So we don't get imported fresh cheeses from Europe made with unpasteurized milk. Uh, there's a concern that anything that hasn't been aged for at least 60 days could potentially have pathogenic microorganisms in it because there's a concern about listeria bacteria, which can be very, very deadly. Where we're selecting for certain organisms by using stuff like salt and temperature, humidity, um, certain growing conditions and certain treatment process decisions to get bacteria and yeasts and molds that are safe for our food. What is it to cure? When we cure black tea or when we cure tobacco or when we cure illness? Fermentation as a whole is essentially like a biotransformation mediated generally by microbes and it is turning sort of one thing into another thing through the metabolism of a microbe. You've just created a more stable form of that food. The crust, the color of the crust. This is a six months old cheese. This is going to sound like a silly question, but can you describe the smell? All this microorganism which are present in the cheese, in this cheese cave, also develop a volatile component which make the smell of this cave. Whoa. <laughs> when you have a good penicillium strain or another type of fungi, that is releasing enzymes and helping to spur the activity of bacteria in the cheese or even the, the sort of co-fungal activity is the release of flavor, uh, flavor compounds. And so that takes the form of stuff like ammonia, amines, aldehydes, phenols, indoles, alcohols, ketones, all of these aromatic molecules that really give cheese its character and its flavor beyond just being kind of a, a fatty, gooey mess in your mouth. The lactic acids after when we put the cheese in the cave will be eaten by all the germs that make the cheese taste nice. If we don't remove the sugar, there is so much food for the bacteria, there's a ton of lactic acid in it, and within two, three, four days, the cheese is already tasty enough to be eaten. But this one we want to keep it for three, four months. And some are of uh, some cheese we want to keep them for a year. Yes. If we don't remove the sugar, within a few days, the flora around the cheese, the germs, will be so strong and so powerful, it would, uh, not, we would not be able to keep it for a year. Well, so fermentation is one of those things that helps preserve food and increases the nutritional content by making the compounds in the food more bioavailable to us because we're benefiting from the work that those microbes have done. They're doing the legwork and we get the benefits of, of eating their, their metabolic byproducts or their poo, basically. Um, we're eating bacterial poo when we eat cheese, but that's delicious, right? This cheese is Le Beaumont, and Le Beaumont is a small, soft cheese, 500 grams, and it's affinated only during one month. And this one is the carré bleu, which would give in English the blue square. And it's a blue cheese, uh, affinated thanks to a special uh, yeast, which is called Penicillium Roqueforti. And the third cheese, which is affinated in this cave, is La Tome de Saint-Eluce which is our uh, uh, mountain cheese, very young cheese, which was uh, produced only three days ago. It's quite interesting because it's just two weeks old. And this is mold, and this mold is called poil de chat in French. Okay. 
cut hair. Cut hair appears when the cheese is about uh, 10 days old and stays during two weeks on the cheese. And afterwards is all the molds and all the yeast and all the bacteria which take the place. Depending on you see here, there are all the uh, mold here, yellow ones, you have also some white ones. And so fungi are fundamentally changing the ecological conditions within that cheese to facilitate the release of flavor and facilitate you know, a whole spectrum of amazing compounds emerging from that cheese that give it so much character. I would compare that with that DVD of a painter. Yeah? You can decide as a painter, as a painter to make a piece of art only with orange. It might be beautiful, can be uh, modern art, but if you have only pieces of art painted in orange, at the end it can be annoying. But it's the same for listening. If you have music always with the same note, you will get annoyed. For me, transformation is correlated with time. As every second that happens, that flows, uh, all the environment is uh, changing. So we always have to adapt. We always transform every second, every day, every, every week, every year. Is it true to say that when you see the molds, different molds, that it's proof that it's working? What is working? That it's fermenting, it's changing, it's evolving, it's transformative. You mean I believe what I see? <laughs> if you don't go through this complexity, you don't pay attention at the end of the process of the Earth, our Earth, our village where we all live, Anglo-Saxon speaking people or French speaking or Russian guys. If you don't respect the earth, the earth comes back to you and makes you understand that it's not possible to go on living without respect for the earth. Here we are. Welcome back. 30 minutes later. My big piece of cahier is well compact. I just chopped it in eight pieces and this is going to turn into a nice raclette cheese. Fromage. 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 Oh, yeah. Raclette. Oh, yeah. Tasty raclette. Did you like were you like an apprentice and then you Yeah no, they, they just hired me and uh, they started teaching me. I'm a civil engineer by um, I, I have nothing to do with cheese at the end. <laughs> so, but I love it. I think the two things that drove me to pursue a life of fermentation and an interest in fungi were beer and cheese. And those are still two of my favorite foods. You ate cheese, you had pleasure, and the day after you remember it, and it gives you pleasure. Cheese is a little bit of a drug. The casein molecule, uh, when you break it up in your, in your gut, when you digest it, there are components of it that have a bioactive property that's very similar to opioids. Is that when you digest milk, you release little bioactive uh, peptides that have opioid activity and activate opioid receptors. And so by stimulating the opioid activity, you get kind of sleepy, kind of relaxed, kind of tired, and very addicted to wanting more. And that's good for a growing calf. You want to drink as much milk as possible, become a big healthy cow, or say you're a baby human, you want to have milk all the time. But if you've ever seen a baby ask for milk, like, they're nice about it. They're little freaking drug addicts because they're addicted to the opioids that they're getting from the milk.